start in the skin today I'm expecting it to be a shorter lecture we're gonna go through the whole skin lecture then we'll stop We'll take a break here, and then I have slides out, and we're gonna look at two slides. We can also use the um, opportunity to look at other slides from other tissues. The two slides we're gonna be checking out today is gonna to be the scalp, so we can see the hair and some accessory components to that. Um, and then we'll look at the skin, of the sole of the foot or the palm of the hand, so we can see the sweat glands. And so that's our plan, plus as well as the layers, the epidermis and dermis. So that's gonna be our activity after we go through the content component right now. So the, what we're gonna go over today is primarily the functions and of the skin as a whole, as well as then the epidermis itself. That's gonna be our stratified squamous epithelial tissue that's sitting on top of the dermis. The dermis here is actually the true skin. That is made of the dense irregular connective tissue and that's really what skin ultimately is. Epidermis is just this little protective layer that's on top. Um, then we'll talk about accessory structures like the glands and hair follicles, things like that. Um, some of those we've already gone through when we dealt with tissues and epithelial tissue. And then we'll finish it out with just repair in of skin as well as burn classification. So for the skin, it's known as the cutaneous membrane. The cutaneous membrane is made up of the epidermis for so that top layer the cutaneous membrane or the skin, what people think of as skin, is the epidermis plus the true skin being dermis. Those are the two components. The crazy part is the dermis is the thicker main part that's our skin. It's only going to be two big layers. And then we're going to learn about five tiny little layers that make up just our epidermis, but a lot of focus gets on there. So sometimes mentally they sort of seem disproportionate, but the epidermis is still really tiny and thin. The epidermis part it's a part if you're scratching your skin and you know you're just not drawing blood, then you're just in the epidermis because it's all epithelial tissue. So remember, epithelial tissue is avascular. If you claw yourself enough that you're now drawing blood, you just penetrated the epidermis and now you're in the dermis proper, and that's where the blood vessels will be. Um, and then below the skin, we have the hypodermis, also known as the subcutaneous layer. So there, sometimes people think they're different layers. So I try to put this to consolidate those kind of those terms. So we have epidermis is on this upper portion that we can see in this slide here. It's just an old black and white slide. And I use a lot of black and white slides, at least in the workbooks, because I, it's my hope that you will color them. Um, so that's why they're there. Plus, I like them, the vintage look sometimes. This is the dermis. This is right under the epidermis. And then way down is going to be the hypodermis. So it's really this middle area that you're going to have your dense, regular, irregular connective tissue. So the role of skin is protection. Primarily, we're going to protect ourselves from abrasion. You know, that's where we have stratified squamous, even stratified squamous down the esophagus, protection from the abrasion of like eating tortilla chips, even that. Dehydration. We have a waterproof barrier on our epidermis that actually, instead of waterproof, of not letting water in, it's preventing us from letting too much water out and dehydrating our cells. And immunity. These are two of the biggest ones I think that we really have to fixate on when we deal with burn victims or people that are missing their skin. And then UV blocking. They're actually preventing the harmful UV rays from doing damage to our body. And we've all seen the effects of UV light, um, especially here in Arizona. If you have curtains facing sort of like a South facing window, and so I have a kid's bedroom. We have a curtain, they're dark blue, but the part that is by the window is gray because the UV light, the waves of the UV light blew apart the pigment molecules. So you're actually seeing effects of UV light. If you see a tarp, you know, over a stack of hay, and after a while it just gets all thin and shredded, it's not like someone was rubbing sandpaper on it. That's just UV light. It's the power of UV light that's actually breaking apart molecules and bonds. So our um, skin actually has mechanisms, meaning our melanin and our pigment, that's actually trying to block some of those harmful rays in order to prevent that from damaging us. Um, temperature regulation. So the skin allows for the blood vessels to dilate. You'll see people that get really flushed and they got red faces and that's a way to get the uh, blood to the surface to try to like let just some temperature, some heat off of our skin. And then you throw in sweating on top of it and then it's excellent at wicking um, heat, dissipating heat from you. For instance, if you take a shower 
and you don't dry off and you step out, just having cold water on your skin and then any breeze going by, you get a lot colder than if you didn't have the water on your skin. So that's how the combination of actual sweating and bringing blood to the surface of our skin is incredibly effective at dissipating heat off of us. Sensation, obviously we have nerve endings in our skin. Excretion, we're going to be, um, there's a lot of glands, whether it's oil by our hair or various, we've already talked about a couple of types of glands, the apocrine or the eccrine, merocrine, eccrine glands. And then vitamin D synthesis, it actually is helping to convert vitamin D, which is actually considered more of a hormone. And so it plays a big role in it. So we're going to go through each of these here. The epidermis, we know it's made of epithelial tissue. It's going to be obviously self-repairing. It's preventing fluid loss. So we'll go through the details of these. We already mentioned these, the fluid loss, UV radiation. All of these components are found in the epidermis that's actually um, addressing these concerns. So the vitamin D story is from the sun. Obviously, we have our waves. So the waves, these are the, actually the sun waves, the UV light is coming down. And this here is an expanded view of the epidermis. This is the five layers and then the dermis would be below it. So this is the surface of our skin. So it's coming through. And at the very bottom of the five layers that we're going to learn about today, we have melanocytes. Those are cells that are embedded within this bottom layer. And the melanocytes are pigment producing cells. It then converts to D3, call it cholecalciferol. Vitamin D3 is going to then go to your intestines as well as the kidney. And it's going to that, that point convert into calcitriol. So it's sort of one hormone converting into another. And this all started with our melanocytes from the UV light. We've got the calcitriol conversion. Sorry, I said the intestines. I meant liver and kidney. Sorry. Calcitriol then goes to the intestines at this point, and it's now where the intestines say we're going to bring in a lot more calcium. So you can see where sunlight, UV rays from sunlight, play an important role. What if you're living in sort of industrial revolution London and it's all foggy and, you know, dreary at the best of days in the middle of winter, and then you throw in the industrial revolution smoke and all of that, you can see where children growing up and other people, obviously anyone, is going to have lack of sunlight exposure. And who can think of the pathological condition that results from lack of vitamin D? Depression, <laughs> That's what, um, we don't really see it anymore because so much is fortified with vitamin D. So it's very rare, but it's rickets disease. And not you know, that pathology, but it's more of just letting you know, just having lack of sun has severe consequences. And, we, and that's actually one of the reasons why we fortify our food with a number of nutrients, vitamin D being one of them. Rickets disease, you can see where if someone's not getting a vitamin D, especially growing kids, they're not going to absorb enough calcium. So their bones are going to be real rubbery. And we're going to talk about rubbery bones and not very strong bones. They're not going to have a lot of um, calcium to be very strong. And they actually have a very hallmark bowed out legs because their torso is so heavy. Their bones just kind of bend out because they can't tolerate the weight. Um, so it's obviously very rare. And we'll talk about this on Wednesday because Wednesday we'll talk about bone physiology. But I just wanted to make that connection it has to do with melanocytes. But we know the epidermis is avascular, meaning it doesn't have any blood vessels. So we know that because it's epithelial tissue. The cells that we're talking about are stratified squamous epithelial tissue that makes up the epidermis. They're going to be known as keratinocytes. So we know site means cell. So this keratin stuff is this... I like to think of it as Gore-Tex. You know, it's sort of like this rubbery, gelatinous-y kind of weird stuff that our specialized and our cells of our epidermis produce that on the lower levels are just producing this keratin. And we get to a point in our epidermis where this keratin actually gels together when we're so stacked up that we get far away from the blood supply. So we get a ways away from the blood supply, those cells will die. But when the cell dies, they leave this keratin band, and that becomes our waterproof layer that's going to keep our moisture into our body. So that's the keratin. So the cells that make up the, most of the stratified squamous epithelial tissue are known as keratinocytes. But we also have other cells. So I've talked about the melanocytes. They're the pigment-producing cells. 
Um, they're also the ones that can help convert um, over into vitamin D3, D4, make the pigment. We also have a few other specialized ones, but all the other ones, just so the generic ones in there will be known as keratinocytes. Now back to the melanocytes, the pigment itself is known as melanin. Melanin is protecting us. It's sort of our natural sunblock, protecting us from the harmful UV rays. People that don't have very much melanin are a lot more vulnerable to UV damage. The key point here is everyone has the same number of melanocyte. It really is the production. So it's like we all have the same number of pigment factories. It's just whether our epigenetics determine whether or not that production of the factory is going to be high production or low production. So that really is the difference in terms of variations in pigment colors. Even people that are albinos have melanocytes, the same number as anybody else. They're not missing melanocytes, they're just missing an enzyme to actually convert to form the pigment. So the factories there are just missing the critical um, element in that. So how the um, epidermis is made, if we take this chunk of skin, we can see the top of the skin is really rolly, like really a lot of hills. That's gonna be known as the papillary layer. So we'll talk about that. So if we peel off the epidermis, we see the underside of it is also rolly. The reason why it has these rolly hills is so that the epidermis and the dermis can lock in together like a jigsaw puzzle and not slide off. You don't want to sit there and go, whoosh, goodbye, epidermis. And there is a pathology, although I can't think of the name of it, where that happens. So there is, they're not actually, the epidermis isn't adhering to the dermis. And so that's an important component too. So we're just going to peel off this epidermis layer, and then now we're going to look into it a lot more significantly. And we can see this one stripe, that's our waterproof layer that I keep alluding to. So here's the five layers you're going to need to know for the epidermis. I have them named from the top, meaning the outer surface, like what's touching the air, all the way down to the lowest level that's actually going to touch the dermis. So this lighter area here is our dermis. So the start of our epidermis is dyed here in this orange color. And so the very base layer here is known as stratum germinativum. And if that's too much of a mouthful to write, there's another name, stratum basal. But I, when I was a student, used to say basally, just so I could remember to spell it right. That's what it, so it's also known as stratum basal. And the other really important thing is you have to have the stratum. That's part of the name. Make sure when I do ask you, name the layers of the epidermis, and I might say from deep to superficial or from superficial, whichever order, always have stratum and then the name. So that's just as important. You had a question. Yeah. And that's the last layer before the dermis? Yes. Okay. So it sits on the basement memory. So that's going to be the healthy layer because you have blood vessels right here. So they're going to be nice, plump, fresh, brand new epidermis cell, brand new keratinocytes. That's where you want to think of the baby keratinocytes at that point. The next layer, stratum basal or stratum germinativum is along this up and down hilly layer, sort of the first part there. And if you did some sort of imaginary line, the upper of the two line, if you look in this part would be stratum spinosum. And then we have this dark layer is stratum granulosum. It's known as the grainy layer. And it's at that layer that the keratinocytes are far enough away from the blood supply that they have died. And now this keratin is forming this gel layer. That's our waterproof layer. Then we have a little layer above it. Usually you can't discern the next two, but there's lucidum, stratum lucidum, which means the clear layer. It doesn't look very clear in this picture. It's a layer that thickens up in areas that's going to have a high level of abrasion. So here we are. We'll go base, um, layer by layer. So I like to give you kind of the big picture first, then we'll kind of dive down individually. So stratum germinativum or stratum basal, bottom layer, it's going to anchored onto that basement membrane. The dermal papillae, that's the hills, it's going to anchor on there like a jigsaw puzzle. Inside this really low layer is where we're going to find those melanocytes. Those are the pigment producing cells. We're also going to find one of the specialized um, nerve endings, Merkel cells. Merkel cells 
are right up there at the epidermis, so they're fine touch. We're going to learn about some other sensory nerve endings that's deeper, so that's down in the dermis. So like if someone squeezes your arm or twists it, we have different senses that detect straight pressure or distortion pressure. We've got temperature sensors. We've got a lot of sensors, but this one of those happens to be the really light touch because it's just under a few layer of cells, so it's really sensing really small motion. So in this colored picture, we could color this bottom layer here would be considered the stratum basal or stratum germinativum. The next layer up, which is just going to be under the dark layer, this is going to be stratum spinosum. It got its name as the spiny layer. So when they would slice these, make histological um, slices, when they look at it through a microscope, it was more... Um, the cells had a spiky appearance. It's not really how they are in real life. It's really the conditions of making the slide that did it, but that's the name stuck. So if we remember, all of the cells that make this up are, are keratinocytes. So think of stratum germinativum and basal as where keratinocytes are born. And so they're like babies here. And then stratum spinosum is going to be where they're now churning out and they're making the keratin. And I mentioned keratins like this sort of kind of Gore-Tex-y, so we're sort of like mixing the Gore-Tex up, we're sort of just creating it at this point, it's not really effective yet. Keratin can vary depending on the cells producing it. It could make our skin flexible and pliable in addition to obviously the collagen and the elastin, but it's helping, you know, the texture of our skin that way. But it also, in a harder sense, forms hair. And even harder, it's gonna form our fingernails. So keratin, these are these cells that are producing it. In this layer, we now have other specialized cells, Langerhan cells, but I'm a little bit more, we'll focus on Langerhans more in 202 when we talk about the immune system. They really are our immune system scouts. You know, if you scratch yourself and some old bacteria gets in there, Langerhan cell says, hey, body, and brings it back in. Look what I found. Anybody know what this is? And hopefully if you had a tetanus shot, your body would be like, that's tetanus, we better get busy, you know? And so it's kind of like a scout just to say, watch out what's coming into our body. So that's all the Langerhans need. And at the stratum granulosum, the keratinocytes are gonna die. They're far enough away from the blood supply that the cells have become just flat and mush. They're no longer round and plump. And that's where the keratin becomes keratinized. And that's sort of now our Gore-Tex becomes effective. This is our layer. And this is now our waterproof layer, keeping us from being dehydrated. So you can see already some of the important components of the skin is we talked about protection and this waterproof layer. If you're a burn victim and you have a significant amount of your skin where you're, uh, that is gone, your first concern immediately is going to be dehydration because you have so much of your water that could be lost to the surface of our skin. That's going to determine if you're going to live throughout the day. But your long-term survival really has to do with your immune system and how much, how much of a loss this barrier is. So the skin is really our unsung hero of our body and how much it protects us with us realizing it. Stratum lucidum means clear layer. It's going to be really I can never spot it. They all look the same once you get north of the granulosum to me. But essentially, you sort of like, all right, lucidum-ish region, if you will. And then we have, and it's just going to be found in more prominently in thicker skin. Yes. So the lucidum is just going to be like your calluses, your thicker skin, like the soles of your feet and the palms of your hands. And then the corneum is the outermost layer. It's known as the horny layer in that it's flaking off or something. Um, and so this is, I think, of dandruff and flaky skin. And, you know, our body is, if we had microscopic vision of everybody, we'd all look like pig pen from peanuts, where we're just like, got our skin, our skin is constantly popping off us. And it just sounds so disgusting. You know, whatever you're looking at on a person, you're just looking at dead skin cells. But that is also one of the most effective ways that we are protecting ourselves. So if someone has, you know, sneeze, it's cold season nowadays, I sneeze all over you, gross. You know, instead of inhale it, block it with your skin because sneeze on dead cells, virus can't get in, virus can only invade live cells. So, you know, germ lands on a cell and it floats away like on a magic carpet ride, it's not going to get in your body. 
So just keeping things out is an important part of your immune system. And so that's the stratum cordium. Okay, so here's the picture. And so you can see it depicting little pieces flying off. And that's actually the food for the bed bugs, you know, and the dust mites and all of that. So, you know, so we're such giving beings. When you think of it that way, it makes you just not want to think about it when you go to hotel rooms and think of how much skin cells are in the mattresses in there. <laughs> yeah, they get, my dad's a total germaphobe, so he like brings his own pillow. I'm like, your pillow is getting so dirty, getting transported all around. Like, I don't know if that's it, but yeah. So this is a picture of skin of epidermis, but I'm showing you, it's not a great slide, so I'm showing you a bad slide, bad teacher here. But I'm showing you when you see these things, what these white gaps are, they're it just tearing. So again, I want you to think, when you look at histology slides, yeah, we're trying to look at the cells, but I also wanna train your eye to just get used to seeing things. So when there's an artifact that I know to ignore it, sometimes people are like, whoa, what's that one layer right there? That must be lucidum. No, it's just a gap, it's just tore. There's not, it's like nothing in there. So part of it is I want you to see, yeah, you can see the layers, but you can also see where, probably they didn't prepare the slide as well, but you can see it kind of pulling apart. But so I, again, this is part of me giving you training your eye to look at some of these things. This is a much nicer slide and they did a nice job labeling it. So we see the dermis down here, are true skin. We can see these purple cells here, stratum basal. Next one, stratum spinosum. We have the dark, dark granulosum layer, then stratum lucidum, a little lighter here, and then stratum corneum. So you're gonna need to know the components and location of the cutaneous membrane. That means, what is a cutaneous membrane? It's your epidermis plus dermis that we haven't talked about yet. So we've checked off the epidermis side of things. What are the functions of the skin? You know, UV protection, abrasion, immunity, We've got conversion to vitamin D3. So there's a list. A little bit, you'll need to know these. I'll have, these are things I'll ask you on the test. What's the role of vitamin D? Obviously, it's going to help ultimately absorb calcium from the gut so we can maximize the absorption of calcium from the food that we eat. Features and functions of the epidermis. We want to know the five layers. We want to know stratum basal, stratum spinosum, stratum granulosum, stratum lucidum, and stratum corneum on each of the layers. Not only do you wanna know where they are, you wanna know what's going on at each layer. Okay, stratum basal, melanocytes are hanging out there, but it's also where the keratinocytes are born. They're just like first made there. Stratum spinosum, the keratinocytes are now starting to produce the keratin. They're starting to actually be functional. By the time they get to stratum granulosum, then they've died. And now that keratin is going to get keratin keratinized and it's gonna be more of that gel waterproof layer. And then the lucidum is more there to get thicker if we have high abrasion regions. And then the corneum is just the outermost layer that's just going to flake off and that's protecting us with, based on our, like our immune system and just keeping any germs away and off of our body. So you want to kind of think of it, not only name the layer, but just think about something going on at each layer or some feature that you would find there. Um, and then the function of melanocytes, we all have the same number. It's just their production that makes melanin, which is the pigment. And then I just did the layers of epidermis cells. The next part we're gonna go through is the dermis. This one's the true skin, but it's a super easy part. This is actually the shortest part. So of the dermis, we have the dermis, we draw on here from this point, and I probably already have it. That's that bumpy up and down papillary layer. So I'm gonna draw a line I'm really bad at drawing lines. I got a weird, bad spatial distortion here. So our papillary layer and our reticular layer, these are the two layers of the dermis itself. The papillary layer is really, if you outline the bumps and then did just kind of a generic line that kind of would go from the bottom bump and just straight across, that's really what the papillary layer encompasses. And then the rest is gonna be this reticular layer. So the dermis is true skin, located below the epidermis, but above the fat layer, our subcutaneous layer. It also is a place, because of its dense, irregular connective tissue, is what's gonna anchor a lot of our epidermal glands are made of epithelial tissue. Hair is made from epithelial tissue. 
they are, and so is the epidermis. So the, the epidermis, it's almost like the portions come down to make the glands or the hair follicles, but it's anchored in with the connective tissue of the dermis. So we have the papillary layer that's going to be helping to anchor to the epidermis, but then the real um, strong component is going to be our reticular layer. Dense irregular connective tissue. It's our second strongest connective tissue. Who remembers our strongest connective tissue? Dense regular, yeah, because dense irregular has lots of collagen, but in different directions. Um, so dense irregular is our second strongest. We're dealing with the papillary layer. I put not really here because I'm disagreeing with the book in this part. You have the papillary layer and the reticular layer. And the book says, oh, the papillary layer is made of the areolar connective tissue. You don't see it. We look at it on histology slides, look at the microscope slide. It just is a layer that's up and down. It's all of a sudden not turned into different fiber types. So it's a little less strong if you really want to think of it, but that's because you're cutting in and out of the layer, trying to make the bump so that you can lock in with the epidermis. So I want you to just ignore that part from the book and just consider the dermis. If I say what type of tissue is made up by the dermis, just say dense, irregular connective tissue. And just leave it at that. This is our list of sensory receptors in the skin. Thermo, it tells you what it does. It's a thermo, temperature. So it's a temperature sensor. We have a hot temperature sensor and we have a cold one. They're different ones. So they're just saying, hey, FYI, something hot sitting here. FYI, something's cold. We have just your straight up free nerve endings. These are just little nerve ending like feelers out there that that's why you get like a tickle or some irritant, you know, it could be due to a number of things. They're just out there, pain, itching, tickling. Um, the root hair plexus, there's nerves that go to the bottom of a root. So anyone that's plucked a hair out will know that that's the case. So there's your own senses there. We already talked about the Merkel cells. They're really high up, it's fine touch. These other ones, mice nerves, Pacinia, and Ruffini, they're deep into the dermis. So we've got mice nerves as you're touched and vibrate. I mean, they, they detect lots of different things versus um, deep pressure as your Pacinian, Ruffini is more to skin distortion. Question? Uh, yes, so these receptors are just general in the skin, but not part of the dermis technically? They are components within the dermis. They don't make up the dermis, but they're found in the dermis. So how, if the dermis is under the epidermis, then how are things like Merkel cells, which is fine touch on the way outer layer? So it's n nerve ending is way on the outer layer, but then like the nerve still coming down through it. So it's like little sensory endings there. And then you have another one that the sensory ending is a little bit deeper down. Like, yeah, because they're just There's a- like a receptor in the top of that, then the nerve goes all the way down. Yes, yeah, so a nerve would be, it's going to go all the way to the spinal cord, but that goes all the way out. It's a little axon, goes all the way out, it's into the skin, but this, the Merkels are just really high up, so they're closer to, there's not a lot between the sensor and the touch side, where like the Pacinians are deeper, so you have to push harder on the skin to trigger the Pacinian response. So that's why you need a deeper pressure to get a Pacinian to even know. That's why, that's how your brain can interpret how light something has landed on you or how rough something is. It's a, a gauge of which receptors are coming, um, feeding into your, because your brain then gets all the sensory input and then it makes a map of what's actually happening. So you can have your eyes closed and tell if, you know, a rock's laying on your arm um, or even your watch. When you first put a watch on, you can feel it, but then they accommodate quite quickly and then you actually ignore it because you have all this sensory input going to your brain and your brain's like, I already know, I'm just ignoring that right now. You know, so it will stimulate a Pacinian corpuscle, but your brain will accommodate to it pretty quickly unless it shifts around and then it resets it. Below the dermis, we have the subcutaneous layer, hypodermis, and it's made of fat. Um, this is going to be part of our fatty, our, our protection um, and our fatty layer. So if we just gain or lose weight in general, that's often where it goes. Um, fat can also go other places. This is also where you're going to go for some hypodermic injections because hypo means below. So just the word hypodermic tells you it's below the dermis. So that would be in the subcutaneous layer. Yes. 
So which term are you going to be using on the test? The beginnings or I prefer hypodermis because I feel like dermis is the skin and then you have epidermis above it, hypodermis below, but cutaneous pops up in the book. So either one works. And, but I also try to put in there not to confuse and add more terms, but to help you understand they're the same thing. Cause oftentimes students looking in different books will go now, well, layers this one. I thought I already figured out the hypodermis. Now we got this other subcutaneous layer. And then that's where you're like, okay, just, they're the same thing. And incidentally, the dermis is what leather is made of. And that's why leather is so strong. If you're, you know, skin animal and you take the epidermis off, you take the hair off and you let the leather dry, the dermis dry, that's what ultimately becomes leather. So do we know the layers? Easy. Two layers. Papillary layer is the bumpy layer. And incidentally, I forgot to mention this, on the papillary layer side, we just saw it as bumpy hills. And that's if you're looking at from a side view. But if we were to look at it like this, when we come down to our ends of our fingers, the way this bump swirl actually forms our um, fingertips and forms our fingerprints. So the, pat the fingerprints that we have is a manifestation of the arrangement of our papillary layer of the dermis, but at the ends of our fingers and our toes. So, and then you should know the sensory receptors. So I'll ask about light touch, harder touch. So like a Pac-Man, the Fascinian, twisting, um, what's gonna sense temperature, that would be easy. Thermoreceptor, um, a free nerve ending would be more pain. Um, yeah, so the, to be able to name some of those receptors. Later, this accessory structures are just other stuff. So yeah, the nerves were probably considered an accessory structure, but they don't really categorize them as that. The accessory structures are like things like hair follicles, what are the components of hair, as well as our fingernails, some of that we did the other day, and glands. They would be hair, okay, that's going to be one of the accessory structures. We're going to talk about the hair follicle. Part and components that go along with that hair follicle would be erector pili muscles. So anybody know what that does? Yes. Excellent. So pili means hair. Erector means lift it up. So an erector pili muscle, when you get cold, is actually taking the hair, your hair, and lifting it up. And so it's less obvious in humans. I mean, obviously we get goosebumps. You see it as a goosebump. But if you've seen um, animals, like say a dog that's being aggressive and their hair sticks up like in the back of their neck, that's erector pili muscles taking a hair follicle, which normally if this is the surface of the skin, the hair follicle is going to be, you know, below the skin, but at an angle. And so then you have like a little muscle down underneath the skin that's going to then contract and make the hair stand straight up. And so that's, and so in humans, we see the bulb of it here as a goosebump as the hair is standing up. Um, and in animals, because they have thicker hair, you're seeing more of the hair. We do it when we're cold because in a weird way, so it helps like if you're a hairier person um, or men, men tend to be hairier than women generally. Um, if you're cold, the hair that lifts, it actually is kind of giving you your own little downy coat. Like it's the lifting of the hair is supposed to be trapping heat more easily between you, like you're all like a little Patagonia jacket on your own self. Um, so the, and I hadn't thought of this before when I was in high school, I was on the swim team and I remember we were getting ready for our first race and this one friend of mine, this, this boy that was on the team with me, that, so they were like, we gotta shave your legs and all this, so he'd never shaved his legs before. Like, of course, why would he? So he, here he is, he's going to the end, it was in the middle of winter, I remember he shows up to school and he's just, freaking out. How do you girls do it? I am so cold. I'm just freezing all day. And so he really learned the value of good hairy legs and kept his men warm. And so anyway, so there is some heat component to the loft of having hair and skin. And, and that's what the, that's the whole point of what that's for. So, but they're called erector pili muscles. We're going to look for them under the microscope slides when I get to that part. And then sebaceous glands, so just put, to complete your notes, I put holocrine, because remember that's the method of its um, secretion. But sebaceous glands are oil glands. They're always gonna be next to a hair follicle. 
So that's why our hair gets really greasy and oily if we haven't washed it for a while, because it's actually coming out the same pore that the hair is coming out. It's actually helping to keep our hair glossy and healthy looking too. But if you have too much of accumulation, it can actually stick to debris and stuff. And that's why it looks dirtier, but that's the, where it's coming from. So we're gonna see those. Then we talked about the two different types of sweat glands. We had the watery sweat, just your plain, I'm hot, I'm trying to cool off sweat. And that was the eccrine or merocrine type glands. And then remember the stinky sweat, those are the ones that are in our armpits as well as our genital regions. Those are the apocrine because they're gonna put out a little bit more protein and cell chunks. And they're really the basis of the pheromones and the smell that is you, you know, that kind of thing. So a unique thing that has a lot more components that's probably a lot more reproductively um, important in animals with seasonal gestational type things. So, um, but that's the two glands. We'll be looking at those and then we'll talk about the fingernails. So these are all different things that are considered accessory structures to skin. Hair, like I said, hair is made of keratin. The same stuff that's gonna be our waterproof layer of our epidermis, but obviously in a little bit more um, greater form. We'll see. So hair, now we have people that have dark hair to really light hair. And so it's because melanin. So remember the pigment of our skin, we also have melanin concentration at the roots of our hair as well. So the melanin cells here are actually contributing pigment when the hair is born, sort of at this bulb part. So the follicle itself is made of stratum basal. So if we had, say, here's the surface of our skin, and then we had our you know, papillary layer here, so if all this here is our epidermis, and then we have, you know, our dermis down here, and we had our, that part here is going to be our papillary layer. And then we have the reticular layer. Then we would have, I'm just going to draw a bunch of circles here. The so circles with little dots on the side would represent what type of tissue? Adipose tissue in our hypodermis. So we have this, and so we'll go back to the hair. If we have our stratum basal layer, this bottom layer of our epidermis, it will actually come down and come up. So you can see that it's made still from epidermal type tissue, but it's being anchored and held. In the it stands up because of goosebumps. We have muscle here. So this is going to be our rectal pili muscle. And so when it moves, so I should have drawn this more at an angle. So when it moves, it pulls it up. So I sort of did this more as a dip. And then we have glands that are kind of coming as pouches on the sides. But because oil is really fat, when we have our fat cells, we always have it where the fat cells are so filled with lipid that it shoves the nucleus off to the sides. Remember, they look like side view of eyeballs. But sebaceous glands make oil. They're mostly white too, but we see them with the lipid component is a white color, but we see it with the nucleus right in the center. So this whole thing would be that. So that's going to be our sebaceous. And also, one thing that helps us with our immune system even more is it's slightly acidic. We send out the oil up and it actually continues straight up to the pore here. So then the hair would be coming out through here. Then it's the sebaceous gland not only is oily, but it's also a bit acidic. So that bacteria on the surface of our skin, it makes it a little inhospitable and not very much of the bacteria would not like it very much. Okay, so we can see this is a picture. So the slices that we're gonna get are not gonna be like, here's a perfect lined up view of the viewer. It's just gonna be a mishmash. So we've got sort of part of a hair here, cut oblong. We have a bit of a follicle here. Here's a bit of a gap. We can see it going up through the pore. This is another hair follicle, probably like coming out the other direction. So you have to just know what you're looking for, but then the reality is a lot more mismatch than you want it to be. These guys here, are the sebaceous glands. They're usually a, you know, associated with a hair, but it's hard to sometimes get a 
a good slice where you have it nicely tucked in next to it like the drawings would be in your textbook. Here's another picture. This one's a lot nicer. You see a nice hair follicle. This is actually a smooth muscle that makes up the erector pili muscle, and then this is our sebaceous gland here. Pick your features that you want, you're looking for. You know what you're looking for, but they're not always going to be nicely aligned. So this is what it should look like. Nice little follicle. You got your little um, pul your bulb here. Erector pili is off to the side. They make it like a big like bicep muscle. It doesn't really look like that, but this is a nicer picture. Hair follicle, sebaceous gland, follicle. This is actually a part of a erector pili muscle, just in a weird location. So it's probably to a different follicle. The erector pili for this one's probably somewhere else. This is a view. You should see this probably has some blonde hair inside the follicles here. And this is what a hair looks like close up. So it's all these layers that are together. Um, people get, and actually whether somebody has straight hair or really curly hair has to actually do with the shape of the pore that the hair comes out at. So that's where, and it can change because so as we age or if people have had chemo and they come and their hair grows back they might have had really curly hair before or like it's going to change because it's really about the pore shape so this is what we're hopefully looking at when we're done with our lecture here this is what we're going to so we pull like i said we're going to look at two slides today one's going to be the scalp so it just is going to look like a bomb so it's where you look at this you're like oh my gosh there's like crazy stuff all over this then you want to go through and go okay what do i need to know from skin epidermis all right, that's that pink stuff at the top. Dermis, okay, that's this lighter stuff. Two layers of the dermis, papillary layer, it's gonna be right under the epidermis. Reticular is all of this other stuff and it has other stuff in it, okay? Then you're kind of going through your like mental Rolodex of items and think, okay, dense irregular connective tissue. We see a hair follicle, it's made of epithelial tissue. Next to it, sebaceous glands, it's gonna make oil. Maybe we'll find some erector pili muscles. Kind of looks like that, but this is a little far down for that. So I'm not really seeing a good erector pili muscle in here. That's pretty much all we can see from there. But it's, so, oh, other good stuff. This here is a sweat gland. And here's some fat. So it's getting kind of deep down. We're getting started with the hypodermis. Now this, do you guys remember the sweat glands? We talked about them the other day, how I said they're like a garden hose. You have this long hose laid out on your yard, and then you decide to bunch it up. But you're just going to be messy about it, and you're just going to like bring it back, and just so it's, you have this giant messy jumble pile of your hose, not the nice coil. You know, like my husband would be mad if I didn't do it that way. So if I'm just doing it my way, like just giant pile. There you go. Then that's how it is in the skin. And then remember how we make slides. You just do a guillotine through. So it's like different sections of this giant jumbled pile of hose that all of a sudden you did a section. So you have tons of these little circles coming out the screen at you because they're coiled tubes. That's what a sweat gland is. So this happens to be a sweat gland cluster. This is a sebaceous gland cluster. So again, training your eye. Fingernails, another accessory structure. We have the nail body. That's the part that we're painting and doing whatever we want to do to it. That's what you're seeing. It's going to cover the nail bed. The nail bed itself is made of stratum basal, which is why if your fingernail falls off, it's really, really it doesn't have all the protective layers there. Um, the matrix is going to be further back. I think I have a picture here. The matrix is further back under because this is the cuticle. This is a side view of a fingernail like this. Um, and so it's way back under, so it's not, it's back where the skin is here, and then it's going to come out over here. So this is the nails, the nail bed's growing out this way. The skin fold, that's the cuticle. And the lunula, go back here, is just this view here. So half the moon. So that's about it. Nails aren't all that important or that interesting. Just have to go through to other accessory structures. I'd probably ask about the nail body. Um, what part makes the nail, the matrix? Um, what's the pale crescent shape on your fingernail, lunula, something like that. So glands, same three glands we talked about the other day when we did epithelial tissue. So remember, 
we have our top one, sebaceous, that's our oil, and then we have these two, the eccrine, which is the merocrine, that's the how it's producing, that's just your watery sweat, versus the apocrine, that's the chunky, it's got the cell fragments, and that's why we get body odor from it. It doesn't come out stinky, it's just because of the cell fragments, it becomes a hotbed for bacteria because it's like your sweat is bringing out that protein and chunks that the bacteria want to come eat. So especially if it's in the dark, dark crevices of your armpits, like dark and all moisty and gross, and you're providing all this protein, it is just a happy place for bacteria. So that's why over time, the body odor is just bacteria gases and the bacteria there. Just the, your own inherent stuff coming out of these apocrine plants, it itself is not sweaty, stinky. It's more after the bacteria has been feasting on it. That's the, where the body odor comes in. So anyway, so we are not naturally stinky. This is really a 3D view of what they look like. So we've got, these are the sweat glands. Whether this one's actually technically the apocrine because it's coming out a hair follicle, hence the genital and um, armpit regions. So that's why they're also associated with hair follicles. This is your watery sweat one. And not so much that I care that you see it here, but I want you to see them as the coiled ball of hose so that if you make a slice through it, it makes more sense why they look like what they do, like whole package, lots of little circles with it if you're gonna cut through these tubes. Again, it's a beautiful picture of a sebaceous gland, like white, filled with fat, but the nucleus is right in the middle, always adjacent to a hair follicle. Sebaceous glands can be secreted based on hormones. So obviously, anybody, hello, puberty, people get a bunch of zits because they all of a sudden have hormones awry. Then you go, then females get to go through menopause, hello, puberty in reverse, hormones go awry again. And then there's it, so there are, and then there's testosterone surges for men. Testosterone usually drives a lot more of it, but obviously females get acne as well. So a lot of these sebaceous glands can be hormonally driven as well. This is a close-up view, you're not gonna need to know this picture. The sudoriferous eccrine, again, watery sweat. This is a kind of a cool picture. You can kind of have a better sense of it being a coiled set pile of hoses with just like one going straight up to the top through the ducts that's going to go to the outside. The apocrines, they tend to be a little deeper here. I know this is kind of a cool one with those things coming up. So think of the apocrine as a stinky sweat, the eccrine, merocrine as the watery sweat. This is a recap from what we did the other day, the modes of secretion, the holocrine, the whole cell will do. Who can remember which of those, the three glands? We have eccrine, apocrine, and sebaceous glands. Those are the three glands that are found in the skin. Which one is the holocrine in that the whole cell ruptures? Sebaceous. So the whole cell is rupturing, plus the whole cell was filled with fat and liquid like oils. So not only do you have oils, and then you have the whole cell blowing up to go, you can see how if you have a lot of production of that, that's how you get acne. Those are the ones that are associated with acne because not only you have oils involved, but you have whole cell debris that makes a feast for bacteria and then abscesses and things like that. That's what acne is. Then we have stinky sweat going on here, the apocrine, and the merocrine is the eccrine one, and that's just watery sweat where the cell stays intact. A couple other glands, mammary glands, we should already know about that, those are breast tissue. Both males and females have mammary glands. It's just females through their high levels of estrogen and subsequent potential for fertilization of an embryo, um, a fertilization of an egg forming an embryo, would then initiate the last two stages of breast development, which actually would lead to lactation. Although men and women have the same breast tissue, their level of activation can only get to step two of the four um, if they have high levels of estrogen. They obviously don't usually get to step two unless they have higher levels of estrogen, but then only women, because they can get pregnant, would get to three and four. And we'll talk about that We'll spend time talking about that in the end of the 202 because we'll talk about breast tissue and the reproductive system then. Then seruminous glands, that's just a fancy way of earwax. So there we go. So that's it. So you should know about the structures and what we went through, you know, 
What are the parts of the structure of hair, components of fingernails, the three main types of glands, and their method of secretion. The last thing that we're going to cover, when skin gets damaged. Obviously, with skin here, with a picture of skin, we get damaged. Cut, sliver, something is going to penetrate the epidermis and into the dermis. So now we have this big crevasse. That here's the epidermis and then the rest here is the dermis and we can see the hypodermis here. The first step of an injury is bleeding. Bleeding is good, can be good, can be bad. But bleeding is good because whatever came in with the offending object may have bacteria, may have icky stuff on it. So we wanna bleed and we wanna flush that out. So it's a way of cleaning it out too. So bleeding can be good in this case. It's actually bringing some germinative cells, like some early growth cells to the area. That's inflammation. We always think of inflammation as being really bad and it's terrible on a chronic situation. But if you're using an acute situation, you wanna mobilize your fighters, you wanna mobilize immune system cells to come in in case any harmful bacteria like tetanus or something had come in or anything else that could have entered your body. We want our immune system guys to be there, take it out right away. We want to have early growth cells that are coming there. So we want to really mobilize our helper components, clean it out and mobilize. So that's what inflammation does in a positive way initially. The blood that's going in there, we're going to learn in 202 about blood clotting. But here, blood clotting involves fibrin, making fibers that form a clot. In the case of a cut, the fibers are actually zigzagging across this gap to actually stabilize this, to help hold the sides together. And then as new cells are growing from this lower level, we're kind of holding it together. So that's why you don't want to pick your scabs. You're just making it harder for your body. We have macrophages, so that's a cell that we're going to learn in 202. Also, it's an immune system cell. And it's just an eater cell. It's just eating garbage. You're going to have damaged cells, damaged collagen, damaged epithelial. You have to clean before you can repair. It's like, you know, a damaged house. You might as well just got to clean it all out before you can get the remodel started. So that's what's going on. The macrophages are in there cleaning out the debris so that we can get our fibroblasts, our new cells, to rebuild this together. Step three is our fibroblast. Remember, fiber, fibrocyte is a fiber cell, but a fibroblast is a cell making fibers, whether it's collagen fibers, elastin fibers. But ultimately, when we have a straight up scar, it's going to actually zigzag straight across. It's like ropes going to either side of this crevasse and tether them, and it goes back and forth and it is this regular arrangement, like a zigzag. If you were looking at, say, stitches in your fabric of your clothes, you don't notice the stitches and the, the, the weave of the fabric unless you are looking near a buttonhole. You really see the stitches there because it's back and forth very evenly. And that's really like collagen bringing the sides together along a cut. And that's why you can see it and it becomes a scar because it's more regularly arranged rather than your normal skin, which is all in different directions. So the fact that you're dense, irregular, gives the sense that you're not really having a specific line that you're seeing. But when you repair along a line of damage, that's actually why you see it as a scar. Um, and so at this point, we're decreasing inflammation, we're backing off from the extra blood going there, we're helping to tighten this up, and then the clot will disintegrate from below. The top scab obviously stays there until the final epidermis lifts off and it goes away on its own. So if you've ever had a damage to your skin and have been good and not pecked at it, you can see at the end the clot, the scab just falls off and there's like, it doesn't look like anything. But if you are an early picker, you'll see various stages of growth because you can see like some of the new skin under there. And also recently healed skin will, um, you have to be careful of the sun because it hasn't had a lot of the pigment that kicks in at that point. So it can often burn more easily or be more damaged that way. So then we finally disintegrate the clot and then that's it. So here's the summary where we have bleeding, inflammation, we have the cleanup crew that comes in, the macrophages, we build new cells, finally the epithelium regenerates, scab pops up, done. So you should know the steps of skin repair. 
The last thing that we're going to go through are burns. So there's two things that we worry about burns if you have a burn. How deep is it? That's the degree. How much got you? How much of our surface? And that's the coverage. So that's going to be two different things. You can have a burn in a really tiny area, but it could be very deep, but it's not over very much. So the degree, your know, first degree, second degree, that just tells you how deep it went, but it doesn't give you an extent across your body at all. So like a first degree is just the epidermis, nothing bad. You kind of, you know, it's all like, yeah, it's a light sunburn. When you get a sunburn or, an, or a burn by touching something hot that actually causes the epidermis to start to separate from that papillary layer of the dermis, fluid goes in there. So you have the early stages of a blister. Third degree, we're all the way down to the dermis and it's not painful. Is that true? So the third degree part is not painful because you fried the nerve endings. So you don't feel pain from there. But where do you feel the pain? Because it still does hurt. All around it, the edges, that's where the nerve endings are like, crap, this hurts, you know, but where the burn itself is, it's nuked. So you're not feeling anything. So that's, the, so that's why it says no pain. And that's where you're gonna get permanent scarring because you're so far down the dermis that when Hairs, if it does repair, you're going to see the scarring from that. Yes. And then fourth degree is like almost amputation. Like it's so far down. You're actually into the muscle and the bone. It's, it's similar in pathology to a crush um, where something's been damaged to that extent. So those are the layers. You should, I'll ask you a couple questions about, you know, blister formation is all mark of what layer burn or just the epidermis, first degree burn. So the last thing that we're gonna cover is what's known as the rule of nines. So I don't want you seeing all this and thinking, oh my goodness, I have a lot of math to do. So I want you to think of, it's a way to just estimate how much coverage is a person suffering from. And this is really important because remember when I talked about burns, if you are losing or you lost the surface of your skin, our biggest worry, our immediate worry is dehydration. So the amount of surface that is exposed to be dehydration gives you an estimate of how much fluid you need to give that patient to replace it until you can get something over that. It's very important to quantify how much surface is exposed and how much surface has been affected. So the rule of nine sort of says like you're just your head, that would be like 9% or one arm, that's 9%. So one arm, equals like the front of one leg. You know, I think about it. So a leg is 18% because you have the front and the back, you know? So that's where you sort of get the rule of nines. And so you add them all up, you end up with 99, or I have the head. The nut, so at the bottom, that should not say head. That should say genital region. Then the 1% is just your genital region, so it rounds up to a nice one. Think of like one whole leg is the same as say the part of your torso in terms of fluid loss. So it really, the rule of nines it gives you an estimate of how much fluid you're gonna to need to replace. We're not gonna do the fluid part, but that's the reason why we need to know it. Test questions on this will be like, okay, a person was in a burn and they had like one arm and the front of a leg, or you know, I'll like give you body patches and you can add it up. And how much is their surface cover, you know, it's going to be affected. So that's the context that you'll see this. There's only a couple questions you know, on the, say the skin repair as well as the burns. There's a depth question and there's a coverage one. So one part of the leg would be 9%, not the whole, Yeah, so like the, so if a whole leg is 18, you can think of just the whole front side being nine and a whole back side being nine. So it breaks down that way. So think of a leg as just double an arm, you know, so, so that's why it's sort of a, a on the fly estimate to be able to um, do that, report that. And here's the picture from the rule of nines and there we go.